What's up, AP Calculus students? Ms. Ford here with another homework tutorial. Now, I said yesterday the one that would be pretty quick, so we'll see how long this one goes. This is 4.2.5, uh, the last of uh, Chapter 4.2. So there's going to be a little bit of a quiz tomorrow. It'll be a team quiz. Um, you guys have been working really hard. There's been a lot of, it's been moving really fast, and I know it feels like maybe you've been less left in the dust a little bit. Uh, the intent is to keep moving it forward, understanding that with each day you're going to see the same concepts again and again and again. So it's not about stopping for mastery after each section. We're going to keep seeing things. However, I'm planning on being out on um, Thursday and Friday. So the plan for then is to leave you with a couple of circuit trainings that will really help you get some of these calculation stuff under your, uh, under your fingers, uh, so they say. Anyway, um, with that having been said, we're going to do all the sections, all the problems in this section. Looking ahead, it doesn't look like they'll be uh, too, too tough, too busy, so hopefully this will be a quick one. We'll see how that works out. 498 is what we're going to do today in class. It's called an accumulation function, which is how we're going to start thinking about integrals as opposed to area functions. Um, the integral from 1 to 4 of s of t dt, s is going to represent the rate that snow falls in a driveway in cubic inches per hour, and t is the number of hours after 5 p.m. We're going to write a complete description about what the value of 12 represents. In other words, in the context of the problem, what is accumulated? Using correct units and being sure to mention the bounds of your description. So, um, a good way to answer this question is um, to remember the acronym NUT, N-U-T. Uh, you want to state what the thing is, the noun. You want to talk about the units, and you want to think about the time. And I'm going to do a little chuckle, haha, at that acronym too, because it makes me uh, chuckle every time I think about it. That makes me immature. Hey, that's the way it is. So um, the noun in this case is snow. Snow is what's accumulating. So um, we're going to say that 12 inches, I guess, suppose, yeah, 12 cubic inches fell on the driveway. Now, I'll, I'll pause here to mention a thing we're going to talk about today in class, is that um, the, the, the rate is inches per hour, cu cubic inches per hour. When you take the integral of a rate, like a per hour, the, the rate part of it falls off, and you start to just measure the cubic inches. That's the connection between an integral and the actual um, thing it's measuring. That's the connection between a derivative, which would be a, a rate, and the original position function, which would be the actual thing being measured. Um, if distance is measured in miles, then velocity is measured in miles per hour. And that's the same connection here between velocity and distance. So 12 cubic inches of snow fell on the driveway. Um, and we, so we, we gave, I guess, the, you might say the noun is there. Um, that's its cubic inches of snow. The unit is cubic inches. And the time um, from... Uh, since, since this is the number of hours after 5 o'clock, then 1 would represent 6 o'clock and 4 would represent 9 o'clock. So from 6 o'clock p.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. That would be the complete sentence that College Board would be looking for on an AP question of this variety. And there will be an AP question of this variety on your test, I promise you. So not too tough, though. It's really just a reading question, understanding that that integral is how you would calculate the number of inches that have actually fallen. Let's look at 499 next. It's actually a pretty easy question because there's no math involved at all. 499, evaluate the integral below. What's the difference between them? Well, the difference, I can tell you right now, is that um, this is just going to be a general um, area function, and this is going to have like a specific answer. Um, however, the big difference here is that uh, over in question A, we don't really have um, uh, we don't really have a top bound. We have to use x. But regardless, we're going to use the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to find the antiderivative, and we're going to plug in the bounds to it. The antiderivative in this case, the capital F of x for both of these functions, would be uh, x squared plus 5x. We've seen this function a lot. You just take uh, that and anti-derive it to get x squared plus 5x. So um, this problem would be, let's see, in parentheses, it would be x squared plus 5x, because we're plugging in x first, minus, uh, well, it would just be 0, because if you plug in 0 to both x squared and 5x, it would just be 0. So in this case, you're just going to get the general antiderivative, x squared plus 5x. You do not need to put a plus c on this, because there uh, are actual bounds on that integral, so that's that. 
um, I can tell you right now that the, this is going to be the same case over here, except for here we're going to get an actual number answer. Um, it's going to be two, or sorry, whoops, the antiderivative, it's going to be 9 squared plus 5 times 9 minus, in parentheses, uh, 4 squared plus 5 times 4. And this is a reasonable thing for somebody to be able to calculate by hand, so we'll try it. Um, we would have 81 plus 45. 81 plus 45, I gotta think for a minute. 86 plus 40 would be 126 minus uh, 16 plus 20, which is 36. And that's gonna shake out to be 90 for the answer there. As far as the difference goes, um, this is more of like the general formula. And this is more of the actual answer for a particular integral from 4 to 9. For question 4, 100, in 4.2.3, you should have noticed a close relationship between derivatives and integrals, just like velocity and distance, which we've been uh, dancing around all year long. The first question we looked at, in fact, this year was the connection between area under a curve and velocity and slope and distance. That's the big connection. In particular, you have seen that if you know velocity, you at any at time t, you can compute the distance traveled from t to, from 0 to x by using that integral, which is exactly what we've been doing in the previous two questions. So question A, which is going to make this problem very similar to the previous problem. If v of t is equal to 2t plus 5 in miles per hour, how far has the car traveled after 2 hours, 5 hours, and x hours? Now, if you've been paying attention. The distance can be calculated by doing the integral from 0 to x of 2t plus 5 times dt, which is exactly what we did in the previous problem. This is the exact same question right there as what we have right here, which means we also kind of have a function for it. It's just going to be x squared plus 5 evaluated from um, your whatever your x value is to 0, if you want to think about it that way. So this is actually pretty easy to do because all we're going to do is plug in the numbers 2 and 5 and x into the equation. So for 2 hours, it would be 2 squared plus 5 times 2. Uh, that's 4 plus 10, 14. For 5, it would be 5 squared plus 5 times 5, which is going to be 25 plus 25, which is 50. And for x, it's going to be the formula that we are using for this problem, which is the same problem, same as the previous problem, x squared plus 5x. That's that. As far as the question of how far did the car travel from 2 to 4 hours, now we're evaluating the integral of 2 to 4 of v of d dt, which is going to be the kind of the same thing we did up here in this problem, only instead of 4 and 9, we're going to use 2 and 4. So we're going to grab uh, a general antiderivative. We're going to do um, 4 squared plus 5 times 4, which we already did in the previous problem, minus 2 squared plus 5 times 2. Let's see, in the previous problem, we learned that 4 squared plus, that's, that's 16 plus 20, that's 36. And then uh, 4 plus 10 is 14. So 36 minus 14 is uh, going to be 22. And so if I was going to write a complete, um, a complete sentence for this answer, which I do want you to do, I would say the car traveled. Because... Uh, the reason why I want you to practice writing complete sentences is because College Board is going to require that on your AP test. So if your AP score is a thing you're concerned about, this is a good thing to practice because it's very much, it's very formulaic. The car traveled 22 miles from t equals 2 to t equals 4 hours. That's it. And again, you're, you're talking about the car is the noun. It traveled 22. There's your units, and you have your time on there, too. It's a complete sentence that describes the integral that you're seeing right here. And the more you can get used to that notation, I think you'll start to see how powerful this stuff can be. Question C. In Chapter 3, you consider the instantaneous rate of change or derivative of any function. Explain why you expect the derivative of a function of a car to be the velocity function of the car. Um, because the position, s of t, that's going to be in miles. And if you take s prime of t, now you're talking about the rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change. I, I, I might say that the rate of change, here's a good sentence to think about. The rate of change of distance is always going to be is the velocity. 
we usually say speed in common terms because speed just means the same thing as velocity. Speed is an absolute value thing, though. In, in math and science, we tend to use velocity because it has uh, positives and negatives, but there you go. S prime of t, again, would be like in miles per hour. Like that. It's just kind of intuitive. Okay, next question. For 101, we've got a bunch of conjectures here, and what we have to determine is if they are always true, sometimes true, or never true. So let's see what we can do here. Conjecture one, if the slope of the first derivative of a function, oh, yikes, I already don't like that sentence, the slope of the first derivative of a function. So I believe what we're talking about here is the second derivative, f double prime of x. If that is negative over the interval from a to b, then a local maximum of the function will exist somewhere in that interval. Okay, if f double prime is negative, that's a good way of saying that, so the translation of this sentence would be, that f double prime is less than zero. Um, that means that we're looking at a function that is concave down. And if we draw that really quick, this is conjecture one. Concave down from a to b, then a local maximum of the function will exist somewhere on that interval. Um, you know, it's easy to say, I, I know this is at least gonna be sometimes true because that's a drawing that does say that it's true. Um, pum, 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 pum. I'm trying to think of a counterexample of this now. A good counterexample would be something like this, where it's always increasing but still concave down. However, if you think about this in the interval from A to B, there still is going to be a maximum on it, and it's going to be right there. This is going to be at the end point. So I think this is always, I'm going to go ahead and put my stamp on it, this is always true. I can't think of a curve that is concave down on some interval from A to B that does not have a maximum somewhere on that interval, as long as it's concave down. Um, I suppose it could be concave down and decreasing, like this, but that would also have an, an, a maximum, just be somewhere on A and B. So, there's that. Uh, conjecture two, local extrema of a, found, of a function are found where the derivative equals zero. Um, f double f prime equals zero. I can tell you that the answer to this one is sometimes. And uh, allow me to explain myself here. Let's talk about, we'll draw a line. Here's conjecture two. Um, if the derivative is equal to zero, f prime of x equals zero, that means we're looking at what's called a horizontal tangent. Now that usually happens at things like maximums and minimums, like these curves, it's gonna happen right there and right there because that's where a horizontal tangent line would come through. However, I can draw a graph like this, like a cubic function, something like that, that does have a horizontal tangent, but is not a maximum or minimum. So sometimes, but not always. Conjecture three, local minima exist at the x values where the first derivative changes from positive to negative. Um, f prime of x changes from positive to negative. This is the same as saying, this is the same equivalent statement as saying that f of x changes, I'm gonna run out of room, from increasing to decreasing. I'll write that down. Now let's think about this one for a minute. I'm tempted to say the answer to this is always, I'm gonna write down an example of how I know it can happen. Oh no, my phone's ringing. I'm in the middle of recording a video. Hang on, stand by, please. Oh, I gotta find my phone. Oh no. It's Mr. Ford. Okay, yeah. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Mr. Briggs left his coffee cup in my room, so he's gonna send a student to get it, so that'll be another interruption for this video. Okay, conjecture three. Um, a graph changes from increasing to decreasing. Obviously, the obvious case would be this. And that does create a local ma a minima, or sorry, local maxima? Oh, oh, okay. Um, that's already wrong, you can tell that much. I think, what they, I think what they're trying to do here is to see if we're talking about minima or maxima. If the graph changes from increasing to decreasing, that's gonna be a maxima, or a maximum, singular of maximum, plural is maxima. Um, no, a, a minimum would happen when it's the opposite, decreasing to increasing. So I believe this is never. And the trick is, is that you want to change, either change that word to maxima or change these words, change the order of that from negative to positive. So there we go. 
Um, conjecture four, when the first derivative and the second derivative both equal zero, the function has both a local extrema and an inflection point. Um, <laughs> interesting. I think this is true, and I think this is always true. And I'm trying to think of an example where it wouldn't happen. Uh, let's think about this. Conjecture four, first, extreme, first derivative. So if f prime of x equals zero, then we've got that horizontal tangent that we talked about. f double prime of x equals zero, we're talking about a concavity switch. There's that student. I knew they would come. Hang on, stand by. I'll be right there. I knew we could do it. Good job. Good effort, everybody. Good to see everybody back. Okay, cool. Um, I believe this is always true. I'm trying to think of an example now while I'm, while I'm drawing it. Uh, we have a horizontal tangent. Is it always going to be a concavity switch? Uh, I think it is. I think it's hard to find an example where this wouldn't happen. Um, I'm sure if I think about it long enough, I can think of an example or film or something, but I think it's true. I'm going to put it down as always for now. Always. If it's not always, it's definitely usually. Uh, I can definitely, the counterexamples to this would be very rare, I would think. Okay, 102. A function is continuous, odd, and the limit as x approaches negative infinity is 5. Sketch a graph of this function. This will be very easy to do. Um, it's continuous and it's odd. So let's go ahead. I'm going to do this off to the side here for 102. For 102. It's continuous, which means I can't pick up my pencil up. It's going to have a limit as x approaches negative infinity of 5. Let's put a 5 right there. Um, since it's odd, it's going to be symmetric to the origin, and it's going to have rotational symmetry. This means that the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x will equal negative 5, since it's got to kind of go... Um, the other direction this way. So let's put negative 5 down here. Basically, any curve you draw now that, that does th this thing will be fine. So it doesn't have to go through the origin, but I'm going to make mine go through the origin just because I want to be particular. There you go. That would be an example of this. That's it. It's got to have rotational symmetry, and it's got to have uh, negative, sorry, 5 over here and negative 5 over here. That's all you got to have. Okay, 103. We're going to build some composite functions here. Our favorite thing in the world f of g of x. So f in the outside part is going to be the sine of x squared. And the thing that we're going to square is going to be g of x, which is the square root of x minus 2. Of course, the square root of x minus 2 and the x squared will cancel each other out. So this is the sine of x minus 2. That's it. If you want to be more particular, I suppose um, it's probably important to just put the square root of x minus 2 in parentheses and then put a squared in there. You can do the simplification if you like. I, I'm always hesitant to do that simplification because I'm always worried there's going to be some sort of thing that I'll miss, so I'm not going to do it. Here we have f of g of h of x, which is going to be very much the same answer, only it's going to have an h of x right there. h of x is 1 over x. So we're going to have the sign, big parenthesis. Uh, inside, it's going to be um, the square root of 1 over x minus 2, close parenthesis squared, close big parenthesis. That's what we're looking for right there. Like net, like Russian nesting dolls, 1 over x, the square root <laughs> of x minus 2, and then you got the uh, x squared, the sine of x squared on the outside. Okay, um, how about h of x being on the outside? This is going to be 1 over a bunch of stuff, um, f of g of x, which we already know. So it's going to be sine of the square root of x minus 2 squared, like that. And finally, I love these, h of h of x. Um, h of x is what's known as a, uh, I'm sure there's a name for this, I'm going to remember it. It's kind of a self-inverse. It's an inverse of itself. 1 over 1 over x is just x. That works too. Um, 104, uh, we have x to the third plus 3x squared minus 24x, and we're asking for when is, the, when, is, when is y prime increasing? Careful on this one. That means that y double prime is greater than 0. That's what we're looking for. Uh, it's tempting, if you read that, if you, if you miss that a little bit, it's tempting to think, okay, when is the first derivative increasing? This is asking when the first derivative itself is increasing, not when the original function is increasing. So we got to go to the second derivative. So the first thing we're going to do is do a quick calculation. 
um, y prime is going to be 3x squared plus 6x minus 24. And y double prime will be equal to 6x plus 6, like that. Um, all we want to know is when this is greater than 0. So when is 6x plus 6 greater than 0? Well, when 6x is greater than negative 6 and when x is greater than negative 1, like that. That's it. Um, and the last question, we're going to write Riemann sums using 16 rectangles to estimate the area under the curve for the interval from negative 4 to 4. Then use your calculator to evaluate the sum. Ha! And here is the trick. Remember that a Riemann sum does not have to involve sigma notation. I was going to throw this problem off until I saw that sentence. And here's where I think we're going to start um, not using the uh, sigma notation. I think we're just going to use um, uh, integrals for this. Now, it does say write a Riemann sum using 16 rectangles. So for the sake of the example, I am going to do exactly that. Um, this would be the integral from i equals 0 to 15 of, let me think about this, from 4 to negative 4 would be a difference of 8 over 16 for our delta x, or 1 half. So 1 half times g of negative 4 plus 1 half i. That would be the Riemann sum for it. We will not evaluate this using that Riemann sum, though, because that would be silly. We're just going to use the integral for that. For question B, it's going to be very much the same. Um, actually, for question B, we're going to have to use two separate Riemann sums because uh, we have kind of two chunks to this graph. This is, this is make this problem interesting. We have a section where x is less than 0 and a section where x is greater than 0. We still want to use 16 rectangles, which means each one of these sections is going to get 8 rectangles. Um, which means we're going to have some uh, different things going on here. Now, um, this part will be evaluated from negative 4 to 0, and this part will be evaluated from 0 to positive 4, like that. Um, that's fine. The only difference, I should make that greater than, and I should make this just a, a, just a less than sign right there. The, uh, so we're just going to write two separate sigmas. Actually, it's going to be the same sigma no matter what, because I'm not going to put the actual function in there. I'm just going to set it as f of x. We're still going to do i to 15. It's still going to be 1 half. It's still going to be f of negative 4 plus 1 half i. It's just that we go to use the integral, which is what we're going to do. We're the integral from negative 4 to 4 of g of x dx. And over here on question b, we're going to have to do two separate integrals. We're going to do the integral from negative 4 to 0 of 3 times dx plus the integral from 0 to 4 of x squared plus 3 dx. That's the only difference. We're going to split the second one into two separate integrals since they don't really combine together like that. Uh, yep, that will do the trick. So on the calculator, let's do the rest of this on calculator cam, and I'll write the answers down as we get them. We're just going to use the integral for this. Bop, bop. So negative 4 to 4 of, we have g of x is x times the sine of x squared. I've always hated that notation. There we go. dx, which is going to come out to be 0, which I like that. That's actually a really important point, is that sine, this is an even function. Actually, no, it's an odd function. Sorry, I should point that out. You don't need to understand that right now. It's okay, but that's an odd function. So the integral from negative 4 to 4 will be 0 because odd functions have um, origin symmetry. So the uh, area into the curve from 0 to 4 will be the same as the area into the curve from negative 4 to 0, only they'll be opposites, so they'll cancel out. That answer kind of makes sense. And for the next question, we're just going to do two separate integrals. Uh, those keystrokes are always going to help shortcut things. We have 3 dx plus... Uh, the integral from 0 to 4 of x squared plus 3. You know, a lot of times on uh, the AP test, they'll give you a question like this, and they'll say, set up the integral. Don't worry about solving it. They'll just say set it up, which is important, too. 45.333, three repeating, will be the answer there. That's what we're looking for. Hey, cool. This one came out to be only 25 minutes long. Um, you're going to get a break from CPM-style homework for a couple days because... Uh, right now, the plan is that I go to surgery on Thursday, and I won't see you again until Tuesday. Uh, we'll see how that plan shakes out. I have a meeting with the doctor, so well, we'll see. Who knows? I'm kind of freaking out about it a little bit myself, but you guys are great. Keep it up. I'll see you in the next video.